After all the guilty pleas and charges, today is an unusual point in modern American history. The campaign chair for a sitting president facing trial for crimes that could give him life in prison. Mueller's prosecutors throwing the book at Paul Manafort today, and that's a bad association for any White House, a trial like this, though prosecutors do say they do not expect Russia to come up, meaning this trial is not expected to break through answers on collusion. And that actually makes it quite odd that this is the week that Trump and his allies are bringing up collusion, not to say it never happened, but to claim, as we've been reporting tonight, that it's maybe okay even if it did. The argument is that collusion is not a crime, so even if more evidence comes out about it, that's okay. They also argue that those rookies in that meeting didn't know better, which doesn't really apply to a veteran operative like Paul Manafort. Now, colluding with foreigners to impact a U.S. election is a crime. Let's go through it briefly. One, it's a crime to get anything of value from foreigners. Two, it's a crime to defraud the United States. Three, it's a crime to steal things, whether you steal objects like everything that was ripped off in Watergate or you steal email, which is what is at issue in Mueller's latest indictment. And finally, four, it's a crime to engage in a conspiracy of any of those other crimes. So collusion is not only a crime, collusion involves at least four crimes. Those are the legal facts. Now, in fairness, we will note here, as we have many times on this program, no American has been charged with any of those potential crimes I just mentioned. In fact, Bob Mueller may never charge any Americans. So that could be a good thing if you are rooting for this White House to escape any collusion culpability. But these are crimes. They do exist. And that's what makes it so odd to watch the Trump team's evolving defense. Collusion is not a crime. Um, and so the fact of the matter is that we're a long way away yet from having anything um, to talk about here. Collusion is not a crime, only an antitrust law. You can collude all you want with a foreign government in an election. There's no such statute. But what crime? Right. Can I anybody identify the, the crime? There's no evidence, by the way, of colluded with the Russians. It's not a crime. Collusion is not a crime. Well, there's not any evidence of any collusion here involving our client. That drumbeat, of course, escalated this week with Rudy Giuliani's interviews and a presidential tweet today. They never used it. That's the main thing. They never used it. They rejected it. If there was collusion with the Russians, they would have used it. I've been sitting here looking in the federal code trying to find collusion as a crime. I don't even know if that's a crime, colluding about Russians. I'm joined by former federal prosecutors John Flannery and Seth Waxman, Natasha Bertrand, Hi. back with me as well. Uh, John, take it away. <laughs> well, these guys sure shouldn't be teaching first-year law, criminal law. Uh, there's also not in the, the code you won't find colluding with Russians either. But the definition that we're concerned about is when two or more persons commit a, agree to commit a crime, that is the crime of conspiracy. And if you are considering the fact of uh, uh, what collusion is, again, it's two or more persons agreeing to commit a crime. So you can't subtract the crime, the object of the agreement and say, well, collusion is not a crime. Uh, and I suppose what they're saying is the technical word collusion, they can't find it in the code. But the elements of a crime is how we define it. And Section well, 371 it's a, yeah, it's a collusion, defines it that way. It's a collusion conspiracy. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and interestingly, if you just take the June 9th meeting, you may have the pre-meeting that Rudy doesn't know happened or not. You're talking about then the sushi dinner? The sushi dinner. Yeah, sure. And, that, and then we have it on June 8th, the Russians put the stolen emails and, and other information from the DNC and the DCCC online. And the next day, they're at the tower, and we're to believe that they talk about adopting Russian children rather than what the email said that put together the meeting that said, Russia likes uh, Trump for president, and we want to help you. And they have a meeting, and afterwards we see that they do it. Right. I, and I, let me go I, to I Seth on the, on the stolen property piece. If material was stolen and just went around the world, on the internet and that's the end of it, then you can make the argument that that just happened, right? The problem is that in their defenses, they seem to be getting closer to the idea, and I want to be very fair here, it is not alleged that they personally received the stolen material yet. But if they did, receiving stolen material, depending on how you do it and what you do with it, can be criminal. And there are precedents, which is what we lawyers tend to look to. Seth, uh, I want to reach back into the vault uh, for this fantastically interesting corollary where when the Gore campaign 
received material that was helpful to it, but they were concerned it might be stolen on Bush, uh, they immediately called the FBI. Take a look. Somebody had stolen it, evidently, from the Bush campaign and mailed it to my close friend Tom Downey, who was going to be uh, Bush, uh, the Bush stand-in and debate prep. Right. It didn't. It wasn't mailed from Moscow, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it was mailed from Texas. We immediately turned it over to the FBI, mm -hmm. and Tom uh, recused himself from the whole debate okay. process. Seth, how does that figure into the analysis? Sure. I mean, that can be aiding and abetting or an accessory after the fact. Someone commits a crime, hacking into computers, and then shares that information with you knowingly and you make use of it. That can be an aiding and abetting crime or an accessory after the fact that under the criminal statutes and penalties, you as an aider and abetter are as criminally responsible as the principal who conducted or committed the act at first. And you offer up four, four crimes at the outset of your piece there. I'll offer up another one that you and I have talked about before is federal bribery sure. and I've been I've been jumping up and down for months as you know writing op-eds and tweeting out that federal bribery statute a 15-year offense criminalizes a, a this for that exchange so if they gave dirt on Hillary in exchange for a promise to uh, lift or reduce sanctions on Russians that is a classic quid pro quo and as you and I have talked about in the past because that bribery statute has that unique language that makes it applicable both to people who have been sworn into office and candidates, it puts it right into the wheelhouse of this time of the Trump Tower meeting and otherwise, and that hammer of a 15-year penalty is far greater than conspiracies to defraud the United States or uh, election campaign finance violations, and that's the kind of hammer federal bribery, and it can be a predicate for RICO and honest services fraud, even 20-year offenses. That's the kind of crime federal prosecutors use to flip senior members who we used to call chief lieutenants of mm. a criminal conspiracy. Seth Waxman uh, citing the term of art in federal precedent for when the bribery liability attaches to a nominee uh, might have been a more impressive legal point than anything you've said, John. I don't want to pit you guys against <laughs> you know, each other. I want to go to, I just want to get that me. dig in there. <laughs> Natasha, on the wider ambit of this, the, the prosecutors are laying out in more than four examples why collusion conspiracies are, are criminal. Uh, walk us through your analysis of the wider politics of this. Why are we hearing about this as the Manafort trial begins? Uh, what kind of tell do you see it as? Right. So what's interesting about this talking point is that it actually emerged in the right wing media kind of around the time that Jim Comey was fired as FBI director. So it seems to emerge any time there's kind of a crisis going on um, with regard to the president's position within the Russia investigation. Um, so now we see it emerging just after this revelation that Michael Cohen is willing to testify to prosecutors that, you know, Trump not only knew about the Trump Tower meeting, but actually approved it. And of course, course, days before the Manafort hearing, which is not going to focus on collusion. It's not going to focus on Russia. Right. We saw today in the opening statements, it really didn't have anything to do with that. It has to do with bank fraud, tax fraud, etc. But still, there has to be a nervousness there because, of course, looming over the entire trial is the fact that Paul Manafort is at the center of questions about whether the campaign did conspire, right. is a better word than collude, with the Russians during the election. So this is not a new talking point. It's been out there. It seems to kind of, you know, resurface every time the White House seems really scared about something. Um, but it's definitely one that is a, a conscious effort to right. shift the goalposts here. John, did you ever see uh, There Will Be Blood, the movie? <laughs> no, I didn't. There's a great scene in there where he keeps screaming, I drank your milkshake. And that's sort of what Seth feels he's done to you legally in the, in well, the segment. Well, I'm not taking out, sides on that. I just want to give you a final, a final <laughs> word. If, if Seth was indeed the, the, the more arcane legal analyst tonight, I'm not taking sides. <laughs> Well, in the case of bribery, you know, it takes only two to tango, and therefore it's not treated the same way as conspiracy, because necessary to a bribery is that there be at least two people. But the thing that's interesting to me about a conspiracy is you don't actually have to achieve the object of the conspiracy. Right. If they had the meeting and they had these conversations to advance the conspiracy, that is to do a quid pro quo with Russia, they're stuck even if they didn't do anything after that. Now, I believe that right. they have, and your question is, will we ever find out that uh, any person or persons is involved in this? And I think you can take that to the bank. Right. It's just and we a question don't know, of but, time. But your point about how many people are involved goes to how hard it is to prove the case. Anyone watching at home wondering what law school is like, it'd be like if this segment lasted 
three years. <laughs> and who wants that? Uh, my special thanks to all of, of our great experts tonight. Hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and we appreciate that.